Let's go in our Bibles. Uh, Father, we have opened your words and we just thank you for your love. Lord, we do not go forward without thee. We pray for a special blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Psalms 103, Psalms 103. Let's, let's turn in our Bibles out as we're at Psalms 103. Let's look at verse 8 onward. We're going to read 8 onward. Notice what the Bible says. It says, the Lord is... Are you there? Let me wait till you're all there. Are you all there? All right, so Psalms 103, picking up from verse 8. It says here, The Lord is what? Merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and what? Plenteous in mercy. What a God we serve. Amen? He will not chide, always what? Chide, neither will he keep his anger forever amen thank you you know brethren we serve an awesome god and i just want to encourage someone this morning this afternoon don't let go of god keep holding on to god sometimes it gets tough you know it's interesting we are here on sabbaths from sabbath to sabbath sometimes on wednesday nights and we come to praise god for what he has done for us but that does not say that it has been an easy road. Amen? From time to time, we go through challenges. And while we wear a smile on our face, oftentimes we're going through difficulties. Sometimes it's sickness. Sometimes it's a burden for someone else that is sick or a child. Sometimes a spouse. Nobody understands sometimes what we are going through. But you know what? God does. God cares. Sometimes because of our weaknesses, we fall into sin. Don't stay there. We serve a merciful God. And he will not always chide nor keep his anger forever. God is always entreating us to come to him. You know why, friends? I'm going to tell you why. Uh, verse 10 says, He will not what? He has not, sorry, dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Do you know that God considers your burden? And what's fascinating to me is that even though we turn our back against God, God still think, uh, thinks about the fact of what we're going through, even though we're the one that placed ourselves there. <laughs> Amazing. Amen? He never overwhelms us. You know, there's many times Jesus said to his disciples, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. And while some of the things they did hurt him, he was ever patient with them. And we are told, um, I think it's in the book Desire of Ages, that Jesus was never one needlessly to censor. Sometimes, you know, as it says, love bears long, it suffers long, right? Notice what we continue to say, verse 11. It says, for as what? The heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. All we have to do is turn to him. Amen? As far as the what? East is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children... So the Lord pitied them that fear him. Verse 14, for he what? He knoweth our frame. God understands you. He remembereth that we are dust. Now, what's amazing to me is that this is the psalmist speaking. He's saying, God remember it. Does God forget anything? So why is he saying that God, is, God remembers? All he's saying is that he's mindful that God knows what we are going through. And so don't give up. I must admit to you, if they did this to the green tree, how much more the dry? You know, we are but dry trees, except for the grace of God. And if they did that to our loving master, Jesus Christ, then do you think, that will go through this world easy, without any difficulties. Just on flower beds of ease, as the song says. 
to heaven. I want to say this to you because you know what? Maybe somebody's ready to give up. Keep trusting God. Keep holding on. Just remember that the time of deliverance, when at that darkest hour is just before dawn, and we are told that at our darkest hour, divine help is near. God will never fail us. God will ever be there for us. Keep trusting him. Don't let anyone steal your crown. Now, you notice I said anyone steal your crown. Some of us, we are giving up too easy. Can you imagine being in the church for 20 years? 30 years? And some sister, some brother, rub you the wrong way. Now you're going to give up. Right at the finish mark. Why? I'm asking you, why? Don't give up, friends. Keep holding on. Keep trusting God. Keep looking to him. Peel your knees. Cry out to God. And when no one understands, God understands. Remember that the brown sparrow doesn't fall from the sky, but God takes notes of it. How much more are you and your concerns? I'm telling your friends, we need to trust God more. And I have prayers that God will increase our faith. Our topic this morning, one thing thou lackest. I want to ask you a question as we turn our Bibles to our scripture reading this afternoon, which is found in Matthew 19. One thing thou lackest. Let me ask you a question. If there was one thing, and I want you to solemnly think about this, just one thing that you think would keep you from heaven, what would that one thing be? Is there one thing that is so dear to you that heaven is second place? Well, today we're going to look into this subject of one thing as it was recorded in the scriptures. And I found it to be that this one thing is our most urgent need. We are told in inspiration that our most urgent need, our most vital need, friends, is a revival and reformation. And this we should seek through prayer. We should humble our hearts before God and ask God to help us. That we can know Jesus for ourselves. Let's have a word of prayer together. Bow your heads as we pray. O oh, loving Father. It's me, it's me, O oh God, standing in the need of prayer. How much I need thee. I thank you, Lord, that you have not forsaken me, but that I can cry to thee, and heaven is always open to hear my cry. We know that prayer does not bring down God, but it brings us up where we have audience with the omnipotent one. And so as we petition our throne to the heavenly sanctuary, where our high priest, Jesus the righteous, is even now interceding on our behalf, we thank you, Lord, that our burden is upon your heart. And we ask for help from your sanctuary, send more of your heavenly intelligence. And may as we spend time in your words, even now, Lord, please, please illuminate our understanding and give us courage that we may stand in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you brought the Bibles with you this morning. And, you know, I'm encouraged to see our Bibles Amen. Just raise your Bible if you have your Bible with you. All right. If you have the electronic sword, that's all right too. Amen. But you know what? There's one time we used to bring our Bibles to church. Amen. Nowadays, it seems as if we're, we're happy for technology, but it's good to have our Bible. I want to encourage that from the pulpit. Now, let's go to Matthew, Matthew 19. Our time is already gone. It's 25 after the hour of 12. Um, and by God's grace want the Spirit of God to slow the time down. What do you say? Now are you play, praying for the clock? We need to start praying. Amen? Fasting and praying. Somebody said fasting and praying. Eh? For the time. Now, 19 chapter of Matthew. Now, we know this story very well. Um, but, you know, as I was really studying, studying, you know, I had one 
thing in my mind that I think the Lord is impressing me, but, you know, as I was looking into it, the Lord sent me in another direction. You know, oftentimes, you know, as preachers and ministers, you know, we're, we're always studying something. Amen? And so when the occasion comes, you know, we say, you know, well, you know, Lord, maybe this is it. And you're looking into it, and, but you're praying diligently to ask God, what would you have me to say? And as I was studying this, the Lord brought this to my mind, and I said, you know what? Lord, if you would be with me, I would present what you would have me to present. Now, we know this story. This story um, is about the rich young ruler. And it was read ably. Um, we're very familiar with it. Uh, verse 16. Let's go there. Chapter 19 of Matthew, verse 16. It says, And behold, one came what? And said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have what? Eternal life. Could you read it with me, verse 17? Now, Jesus said something to him here. Jesus said, why callest me thou good? Now, if you notice, did you examine what the rich young ruler said? He said what? Good master. What, what? Good thing. Now, let me ask you a question. What good thing can you do to inherit eternal life? I'm asking you a question. You can answer. What good thing can you do to inherit eternal life? Are you sure? You know, the Bible says it well. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. There is nothing good we can do, friends, in and of ourselves. I think someone qualified. Amen? We need the power of God, right? And so from the beginning, he was already off in his question, yet still, this question was directed to Jesus, when you read another account in another gospel, when Jesus, when it says that, it is, is almost, if you get the backdrop of the story, and I want to encourage you to look at another gospel, we're not going to go there in your own time. But when the rich young ruler, context is that he was blessing the children, and he was so drawn to that. There was something missing in him. And when he saw how Jesus took the children and how he comforted them and how they found such a joy in Jesus, he knew that there was something missing in his life. And we are told in, in other Gospels that he ran and knelt before him in almost in a posture of worship. And he said, what shall I do, good master? Sincere though he was, friends. Jesus had something to show him. And so we find that he's here kneeling and he's appealing to Jesus. What good thing can I do? Yet still we already know there's nothing good in us that we can offer. And Jesus said, as almost to inadvertently answer his question, he said, why callest thou me good? Now, if you notice our Lord and Savior, I love Jesus. I hope you do too. Amen. Amen. You know, Jesus never rebuttaled the fact that he had said, what good thing I should do. He never, he never even addressed that. Remember, he said, good master. Now, what Jesus did, Jesus asked a question, asked to draw the answer from his ear. Now, notice the, answer, the question that he asked. He said, why callest thou me good? Now, so he turned the, the, the question to himself because he said, good master, I said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, Jesus already set the plane because there is nothing good we can do. And furthermore, Jesus said to him, why callest thou me good? There's only one that's good, that's God. Do you know that the commandments are holy, just, and good? So it takes someone that's good to keep the commandments. Do you agree with that? 
Do you agree with that? Now, I know that we're thinking about that, right? Because if we can't do anything good, then how shall we keep the commandments? But Jesus said it. I didn't say it. Did Jesus say it? That you should keep the commandments? Now, for all those that are out there, and you know, I'm always very prayerful about when I, I'm very passionate at times, but I don't want my passion to get the best of me. It's not about me. I want for us to hear the words clearly without any prejudice or any stumbling block or any barriers. The idea is this, friends. Jesus said, if you enter into life, what is he talking about here? Enter into the life. Hmm? Eternal life. The man, remember what, the, what did the rich young ruler say? What good thing can I do to the what? Inherit eternal life. Now Jesus is about to answer his question. And Jesus said, listen. First Jesus challenged him about what's good. Right? But then he left that almost like open-ended because that was something for him to think upon. Then he concluded by saying, but if thou will enter into life, or we can put it in there, if thou will inherit eternal life, keep the commandments. Now, I didn't say it. I'm just reading from the word of God. Now, why are we at a place in our history where men do not want to keep the commandments of God? If Jesus said it, if I'm a follower of Christ, it don't matter what denomination I'm in, I should want to what? Follow what Jesus said. Now, if Jesus said keep the commandments, and back to it now, the commandment is holy, just, and good, and it takes someone that's good to keep something that's good, how are you following me? Now, and there's nothing good in us, so how is that going to work? Hmm? Somebody said something? No, don't, 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 don't be afraid. You can, you can communicate. We're dialoguing. You go ahead, my dear sister. All right. All right, Jesus Christ. Anyone else? What's our thoughts? Now, I'll say this much. I give God thanks that Jesus is good. Amen? You know, you ask him that question to probe him to think about what's really good in relation to keeping the commandments. Yet still, we know that Jesus is good. Friends, let me tell you something. If it was not for the grace of God, we will not be able to keep the commandments of God. Thank God for his goodness. Amen? And so we know that while it's not because of us, it's because of his tender mercy. We're going to see that later. Now let's go on in our narrative here as we build on this story. And he said unto him, I'm at verse 18, and then I want you to read alternately, accordingly. It says, and he said unto him, which... Now, so for those that believe that it's not the commandments of God, now we're going to see, right? He said, which? Now, Jesus. Now, who is answering? Jesus. It's in red. and Maybe it's not in your Bible red, but it's in red in my Bible. Jesus is answering, right? It says, which? Jesus saith, thou shalt what? Do no murder. Which commandment is that? Anyone know what which commandment is that? Where does that fall in the Ten Commandment? Huh? The Sixth Commandment. All right? Let's keep going. He's giving us some example. Thou shalt what? Not commit adultery. Which one is that? What number? Seventh. Are you seeing something? All right, let's keep going. Thou shalt not steal. Eight. Is it in chronological order? It is. Let's go on. Thou shalt not be a false witness. Nine. Now, Jesus now is about to, and then of course, he goes back. Read verse 19 now. Now, we know that honor thy mother and father is the fifth commandment with promise, right? And then he summarizes, and he said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He summarized it. Question, is Jesus missing something? Which commandment is Jesus listening, missing? All right, all right. Praise God, one to four. Is he missing anything else? 
in the commandments? Huh? Thou shall not covet. That's the Ten Commandments. Now, let me ask a question. You see how Jesus is addressing him. Jesus is very intentional. Question for you. Why, why, why does not Jesus ask him about the, four, the first four commandments? Thou shall not... What's the first commandment? Have, have any other gods before me? What's the second one? Thou shall not what? Make graven images or bow down to it. All right. What's the third one? Taking the Lord's name in vain. And the fourth one is the Sabbath, right? Now, I have a question for you. Do you think a Jew had any problems with the, any of these four? Now, so that is understandable because they were one, God's people. They would not serve any other God. They believe in the one God. They would not bow down to, you know, they were already forbidden to bow down to graven images. They, they, in fact, to this day, they don't call the first letter of the name of the Lord because they believe it's sacred, right? They don't take it in vain. And they definitely believe in the Sabbath. Would we say that? No. All right, with that said, what other commandment is missing? Thou shalt not covet. That's the Ten commandment. Why do you think Jesus left that one out? Hmm? Because he was rich. Amen? I'm glad you're seeing this. Now, so that means that there's something in the last set of commandments, excluding the last one, that Jesus was trying to pull out of this rich young ruler to see. But notice what Jesus does in verse 19. He summarizes all the those last set of commandments. Watch this now. Notice how he summarizes. Verse 19, the latter on. He says, thou shalt what? Love thy neighbor as what? Thyself. So in other words, the commandments is inch upon two commandments really. Love for God supremely and what? Love for your neighbor. First four, love for God supremely. Last six, love for your what? Your neighbor. Now, you know what? Let's finish reading it. Verse 20 says, The young man said unto him, These things have I kept from my what? My youth up. What lack I what? Yet. Now, so, is he asking a very important question? And do you think Jesus needs to give him a very straightforward answer? I think so. Now, read verse 21 for me, please. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. You know, you know what? And you can jot it down. Mark 10, 21 says, it quotes this very quote here. It's a parallel chapter. And Jesus, in that text, Jesus says, one thing thou lackest. And then he said, sell your, your goods and give to the poor and so forth. Thou shalt have treasure and follow me. Now, the remedy that Jesus gave him, the one thing that he lacked, where do you think it falls? Is it love for God or love for man? No wonder Jesus gave him those five pertaining to man, right? He wanted to, for him to what? see the source part that was in him are you with me now you know what's interesting is that and and you know we should take a lesson from this you know jesus could have just tell him plainly that he you know jesus could have just t tell him plainly exactly but you know jesus didn't do that that's right jesus now what jesus does is that jesus allows hearers to think to come up with the point because you know what if you, comes, if you come with the answer, then you can't, you can't, what are you going to do? Fight against yourself? You're the one that came with the answer. Now when Jesus gets him to this place, what happens in the story? Do you think he sees it for himself? How do you know? Wow. Now that means he got the answer, but he wasn't willing 
to comply with what it required. Jesus said, sell all you have and give to the poor. But he wasn't willing to comply. Now here we see a mini eclipse of what caused the Jewish nation in the onset of Christ's ministry to have what I call the Omega of Apostasy. To eventually reject Jesus Christ. Do you know that, friends? Now, let's go in our Bibles. We're going to be studying this morning, this afternoon. Let's go to Matthew 23. Let's go to Matthew 23. Let's go there quickly. Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Matthew 23. So already we have evidence number one where we see that here is a prominent influential Jew that had a problem with how to correlate with his fellow men. In other words, the last six of the commandments. Now we're going to kind of put this thing together eventually. Now let's go to Matthew 23. Are you there? Now let's home in on verse 2. Are you there? Now let's read. And I, you know, Father, be with our minds. Please help us, alert us, quicken us, that we may appreciate, Lord, that one thing that we need the most. Lord, I'm just praying, Lord, for more of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice what verse 2 says. It says, saying, now Jesus is speaking. Verse 1, let me just read verse 1 just to get a context. Jesus spake to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in who? Whose seat? In Moses' seat. Verse 3. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works. For what? They say and do not. Now, let me ask you a question. They sit in Moses' seat. What does, that, was, what does that mean? They sit in Moses' seat. All right, leadership. All right. Is that the only thing? Let's read the text again. It says, All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe. Did I say it or did Jesus say it? Jesus said to observe what they say. Why? There is nothing wrong with what they say because they sit in. Now, what does sitting in Moses' seat mean? All right, commandments, all right. But moreover, they had the teachings that Moses passed on from God. So in other words, the fact that they're sitting in there, they are the stewards of the oracles that God gave to Moses, which now they are to give to the people. Now, but notice now, it says that observe and what? Do. So there's something they should do. What Moses received, they were supposed to observe it and do it. Watch this now. And it says, but do not after their works. For they say something. They say not do. So, all right, let me ask you a question. What do they say? All right, they say the law. All right, the truth. And, and, and in the context here, what, what is the oracles that Moses received? They're saying what Moses said. Right? Based on the context here. But they're not doing it. Is that clear? I want to tell you this much, my friends. That the Jews, you ready for this one? The Jews had another religion. They said one thing, which was Moses, not just Moses' law, but everything that Moses point, you know, gave to them, but the law was included. Amen? Moses is known for that. The law was included. But they did something else. Now, the fact that they did something else tells me that they were practicing another religion. They weren't practicing the religion of Moses. Now, we could see that in many other scriptures where Jesus tells them that, listen to me, if you were Abraham's seed, then you would accept me. And you would do that which Abraham did. But they didn't. 
Now, so we see that they had another religion, and we're kind of getting an insight into that religion based on the rich young ruler. Now, let's get a second witness to the fact that they had a problem with how they related to each other. Let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke quickly. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And we're going to zero in on verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Are you there? <clears throat> Please follow along with me in your Bibles. Take notes if necessary. <clears throat> Luke 10, 25. Notice what we are told in Luke 10, 25. Luke 10, 25. Are you there? It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempting him, saying, Tempting Jesus, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is the same question that was asked by the rich young ruler. Very same question, friends. Notice what he said. Let's see if Jesus will give him the same answer. And he said unto him, What is written, what? In the law, how readest thou? Now, do we need to guess at what Jesus is talking about here when he says the law? We don't have to guess. We already had seen it with the rich young ruler, right? So we know he's talking the Ten Commandments, right? Watch this now. Notice what he says here. And if you don't believe me, let's go to verse 27. And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the, the Lord thy God with what? All thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. So in other words, love for God. And love for man. Is that the Ten Commandments? Fully represented there. Verse 28, and he said unto him, Has thou, he says, Thou hast what? Answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. So, so let me ask a question. If, if, he, all right, if you come to me and you ask me a question, and I, and I turn the question back to you to answer, and you answered correctly, what does that say about you asking me the question? There was no purpose. You already knew the answer, right? And the fact now that Jesus said, thou has answered right, can you imagine now he wants to justify himself? So notice what verse, is, verse 29 says, And he be willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, do you know that the reason why I brought this up, by the way, this was a very controversial subject among them. Who is my neighbor? You know, this is what they said, quote unquote. I know that the Samaritans, they're already dogs. That's how they thought. They thought. Do you know that that's what, how they thought? They believe that the Samaritans literally was their enemy. And keep that in mind, by the way. But the priest said, who is my neighbor? Who's supposed to interact with me as a priest, you know, with the offices and the role that I'm called to do? And then, you know, the, the, the Pharisee said, who is my neighbor? And there was a big, heated controversy over who is my neighbor, and nobody could come to the conclusion. By the way, let me say this much. This man that went to Jesus was a lawyer. No, he's not just a civil lawyer. This was a doctor in the word. Amen? This man was supposed to be able to, to give expositions on the word of God, on the law of Moses. Do you know that? So the fact that he came to Jesus and he asked Jesus about who is my neighbor is because he already knew that he didn't have an answer. So if he didn't have an answer, that means that how did you translate that to physically interacting with others if you don't understand something you can't that tells me that they had a literal problem with the last six commandments second witness now Jesus go ahead and tell the story he said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. 
And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, what did the priest do? He passed by on the other side. Didn't even look at him. Right? He passed by what? On the other side. That's verse 31. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, did what? He came and looked on him. Now you see, the Levite had a little conscience. Some was bothering him. Because, you know what, friends? This, after all, was a human being. And he looked on him. And friends, he came. At least he didn't pass by. He stopped. The deacon stopped. Are you with me? The minister never stopped. But the deacon stopped. Now, don't get hung up on the minister, the deacon. We're talking about a mindset here, friends. And they're all Jews, by the way. No wonder they had a mindset like that because they didn't know how to interact one with another. Now, here's the thing about it. The Levite came by and he looked on him. But you know what, friends? Man, he wish he never even went that way. He looked at him and he knew duty. There was a conviction about what he needs to do. But you know what? He almost said, man... I'm a deacon. You know, I can't get into all of this and defile myself. You know what? <sighs> I wish I never came this way. <laughs> I never even saw him. But he justified himself that he had such an high office that, you know what? God would understand because he didn't want to defile himself. So you know what he did? He passed by him on the other side. Now, a certain... Samaritan. By the way, when he says a certain man, what is he talking about? Is that just a general man? As a specific man. Now, he didn't give a name. Jesus withheld the name. <clears throat> that tells me that Jesus knew who it was. By the way, do you know that this story was true? Jesus said a certain man. A certain lawyer. Right? A certain Samaritan. You know, Jesus knew he was. But Jesus doesn't want to expose anyone. I wonder where you find yourself in this story. Can you put yourself in this story? Where do you? You were saying something? <laughs> wow. Right? So, where do you find yourself in this story? Are you the lawyer? Are you the multitude that's looking on, the disciples that are listening? Are you the man that passed by, the Levi, the priests? But notice it says, a certain Samaritan, verse 33, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, friends, listen to me. Listen to this carefully. This man that was wounded more than likely was a Jew. Now, the Jews hate the Samaritans. But it was a Samaritan that had compassion on him. Now, let's wrap up this story quickly and make some general points and close off. Notice what we are told here. It says that he had compassion on him, went to him, bound up his wound, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, gave him to the host, 35, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come, I will repay thee. Now remember, the controversy was, who is my neighbor? He says, now, which thou of these three thinkest thou was a neighbor? Unto him that fell among the thieves. And what does he say? Verse 35. He says, which thou of these three thinkest thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, who is the he? The lawyer. Are you following? Are you following? It's the lawyer. He asked the question. Jesus tells him this wonderful, real story that occurred. Right? And he said what? 
So he so he that showed mercy on him, go and do that likewise. Now, he could not even, listen, he hate, listen, the Jews hated so much the Samaritans, he couldn't even say the Samaritan. He said, he that showed mercy on him. Now, God, Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. Because he had a problem how they deal with the sixth commandment. Now, you know, I'm going to tell you this much. <clears throat> you know, we are told in uh, councils to parents and teachers, councils to parents and teachers, uh, paragraph, uh, page 32, uh, paragraph 1, right? Well, you know, before I quote that quote, Christ Subject Lesson 391, paragraph 1. The principle of the law must be the spring of all our actions. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the principle of the law? Love. Now, the fact that they had a problem with the last six meant that they really had a problem with all the commandments. No wonder they strain at a gnat. No wonder Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. No wonder they couldn't turn a proselyte into twofold the child of the devil. No wonder they were like white and sepulchers. White on the outside. But full of dead men bone. Why, friends? The, the active principle was love. And because they truly could not understand what it means to love God, they could not appreciate to love their fellow men. Now, I said to you that this was the omega of apostasy for the Jews. Now, let, 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 let's go quickly here uh, to Psalms 40. Let's go to Psalms 40. Let's go to Psalms 40. Hold your hands right there at that store. We're going to go back to it. Psalms 40. Let's go to Psalms 40 in your Bibles. Psalms 40. Psalms 40. Let's go there quickly. Now, by the way, the reason why he said the principal action has to be love and the reason why they could not keep the commandments of God is because they truly did not, not only did they not love their fellow men, but they truly did not love God. That was the problem, friends. That one problem was love for God and love for their fellow men. Notice what Psalms 40 says, verse 8. It says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy what? Thy law is within my heart. Now, when the law is within your heart, what happens? Look at verse 10. It says, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. What's another word for the law? Righteousness. Thy commandments are righteousness. I have declared thy what? Faithfulness. And thy what? salvation no wonder jesus said if you're going to find salvation keep the commandments watch as it says i have not concealed all right remember what it says about jesus jesus did not what hid the commandments in his heart only he declared it now notice what it says in verse 10 i have not concealed thy what are you there i know you listen to me but follow along i i have not what concealed thy what loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Now, if one place it says, I have not hid thy righteousness, which is the law, but I have declared it. And then another place it says, I have not hid thy loving kindness and thy truth. Are those synonymous? Amen, friends. So in other words, the commandment lived out is really the loving kindness and truth of God. Are you with me, friends? In other words, a revelation of who God is, which is love, is really the commandments of God. In other words, my friends, if you're going to keep the commandments, you can't do it without God. And you need to come to a place where you love God supremely and your neighbor as yourself, or else that can never happen. Let's go to a text quickly. Let's go to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. Let's go there quickly. 1 John chapter 4. Let me put this thing together. First John uh, chapter 4. <clears throat> First John chapter 4. <clears throat> First John the fourth chapter. 
And I want to read in your hearing 1 John chapter 4. First John uh, chapter 4, that's where we are. And let's uh, zero down. Let me see where I'm at. Oh, I'm in St. John. <laughs> no wonder, eh? I won't find that text at all. Amen? All right, so First John chapter 4. I'm not there yet. Thank you for your patience. And let's look at verse 17 to the end. Verse 17 to the end. Watch this now. Hearing is love what? Now, by the way, is God love? God is love. Hearing is our love made perfect. That we what? Have what? Boldness in the day of judgment because what? Now, by the way, let me just say this much. You know, things have to be put in your order. Amen? Notice it says we have boldness, what? In the day of judgment, why? Because our love is made perfect. Do you know this is a principle, friends? Perfect love. Notice you use perfect love. Perfect love casts out fear. This is not what we heard in our Sabbath school this morning. The only reason why we're fearful of the judgment is why? There is not perfect love. And you know, friends, on the contrary, friends, our message, our message, while it has elements of judgment, it's actually a message of love. Amen? God is saying, notice what he said. He never said, if you will enter into love and into um, life eternal, make sure you don't. Make sure. Listen what he says. He didn't say, if you will enter into life eternal, make sure you miss the judgment. No. What he's doing, he's inviting him in a love relationship with him. Are you there? No. Let's continue reading. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect fear, what? Cast it. For perfect love cast it out. Fear. Because fear has torment. And he that feared it is not made perfect in love. Now, do you want to know how to love God? And how to keep his commandment? Let's look at verse 19. We love him because what? Now, I have a question for you. How did Jesus demonstrate that love towards us? Friends, let me tell you something. Why we are yet sinners. Why we are yet the enemies of God. Do you know that in a certain sense, and I'm going to close on this note here, Jesus now is saying, the only way, basically, you can love me is by first beholding my love. Listen, friends, the problem where we have and what the Jews had is that we want to keep the commandments in order to please God. Are you with me, friends? We have to come to God and behold that love that was demonstrated. And when we behold that love that was demonstrated, you know what's going to happen, friends? We're going to desire to be like him. We're going to receive him because of his love. And receiving him means that the Holy Spirit is going to come in our hearts and give us the grace to love. Can you love your enemy of your own? Now I'm just asking a question. No. But do you know that the Good Samaritan showed that he was converted? He showed that he was a true seventy Adventist, if I should use it that way. And you know what's funny? He was willing to assist his enemy. Now remember, now, they were just talking about within the context of their own circle, but Jesus says, true love transcends beyond who treats me good. True love transcends beyond those that are nice to me. It is even those that consider me as a dog. 
to assist them if they're in need. That's true love. That tells me that this man had a love that was born not within but from above. Are you with me, friends? And as a result, he could keep the commandments of God. He could, in principle, love his neighbor because he first had a love for God. You see, the one thing that the rich young ruler lacked, friends, is that that one thing was love for God. It was love, friends. The spring of all action. Let me close on this now. Verse 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? My friends, I do believe we all have a plague spot. And if we look really deep within, it's that supreme love for God. It's that love that we need to behold in Jesus dying on the cross. You know, friends, that Samaritan is a typology of Christ. You know, Jesus saw us wounded, bruised, half dead. And while he was in heaven, he thought it not robbery, Philippians said, to humble himself. Listen to me, friends. To become one like me and you. Jesus recognized that the only way he could rescue us from near death is to die himself, to take my place. How did they treat him? Did they welcome him and thank him for what he did? They said crucify him. They mocked him. They spat upon him. They slapped him in the face. They plotted a crown of thorns and they pressed it in his skull. And we are told that every step that the Savior made was trailed with blood. Yet still love drove him. It drove him to the cross, friends. Supreme love for his father. He was on a rescue mission. Supreme love for man. And Jesus died. So that we can behold that man of love. And that we can be inspired to seek him that he may inspire us out to love. My friends, what's that one thing that you're lacking? I want to say that Jesus can supply today. You do not have to leave the same way you came. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you feel like you just cannot gain the victory? Where you feel as if the things of this world is going to just overwhelm you because of what it's required as a Christian to do. My friends, we are thinking too hard. What we need to do is to behold Jesus. Stop thinking about what you're going to say to that person, that person that hurts you so much. Stop thinking about how I'm going to keep the Sabbath day holy. Stop thinking about all of that. What we need to do, friends, is we need to behold Jesus. His love. Let his spirit come into our hearts. And I'm telling you something, friends. We will keep the Sabbath day holy. We will love our friends and our enemies. Oh, yes, my friends. But I want to make an appeal this morning. Only you alone can know if you lack that one thing. And friends, that one thing that you lack is the love of God in his heart. Friends, let me tell you something. Let, let us not fool ourselves to think that we can... You know, and it's funny that every one of us know where we are individually as well as collectively. You know, we know where we are. We know how we feel when... You know, we know how we feel right now. How that person made me feel. And nothing is wrong with your feeling the way you feel. That's just a feeling. As long as you don't give in to it. 
and succumb to it. But some of us are entertaining it. It's the truth, friends. We are unforgiving. We're not loving. We're not kind. We're not patient. We're not caring. Why am I saying all of this? Because you know what, friends? I would want to come down to the end and realize, friends, that all this time I was going through the motion and really I know something was lacking, but I still continued. And now I'm here. You know, friends, this is not a gloom and doom message. This is a message of love. Jesus wants for you to behold him. He's not condemning you. He's saying, come unto me. I want to give you rest. You can't fight that battle by yourself. The battle is not yours. It's God's. And I will carry you through. And so I want to make an appeal. There's no music. You know, you know where you are in your experience. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And you want to say in your heart, first of all, maybe you are not a Christian as yet. But you realize there's something profound about the love of God. I can't understand it. Why would God take such an abuse? Why would he humble himself from his throne where angels worship him? Why would he make such a sacrifice? Even though I may reject him, why would he take the chance? Because love is vulnerable. Love is willing to go to the extent to woo the object of its affection. And so Jesus is wooing you. Maybe you are not a Christian, but you want to say, I want to learn more of this love. In fact, I want to behold this love. I would like to pray for you. I want to say, is there one for Jesus? Everybody should be bound. Just raise your hand. You don't have to slip out of your seat. Just raise your hand. Pastor, I want you to pray for me. That I will behold that love. Praise God. Praise God, my sister. Heaven sees that hand. Is there one more for Jesus? Everyone should be praying. Praise God, my sister. God sees that hand. Someone else want to join that. You want to stand for Jesus in your heart and say, I want to learn more of that love. And I want to demonstrate that love in my heart. Now, second appeal. You are a Seventh-day Adventist. And my friends, I didn't even have time to develop this thing. But I want to tell you this much. The same principle that led them to go astray in the last six, which is the omega, is this, which is the alpha, is the same principle of love that will lead them to forsake the first four in the latter times. It is love, friends. You may say, you, I will never give up the Sabbath day. But I'm telling you something, friends. The temperature gauge is how we are treating each other. Whether we have the love of God in our hearts. Maybe you are an Adventist. I'm going to make a very specific appeal to you. I don't want you to just raise your hands. I want you to stand to your feet. If you want to say, Lord, I want you to come into my heart. I want you to do something special for me. I need to behold Jesus' love that I can be changed. That you can give me what I need to love my enemies. And you know what, friends? Unfortunately, but it's the reality. Sometimes my enemy is in the church. It's the truth. And it's not that you want to be their enemy, but they are your enemy. Because they choose to. But Lord, give me the capacity. I need what you had. When they were mocking you, when they were jeering you, you said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what you do. What manner of love is this? I want that love. And if you want that love today, will you stand to your feet? You see, there was one thing lacking, friends. And I think that is very evident this morning, this afternoon. And I don't know, friends. I know everyone stand to the call. But I really just feel impressed. Maybe someone want special prayers and I want to pray for you as I close I want to invite you to come to the altar to stand on your conviction that you have made I know it's not easy friends but you know Jesus was willing to walk to that hill called Golgotha and stand 
upon what he was resolved to do. In fact, he was nailed to a cross. The song says he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy this world and set him free. I want someone to get relief from the burden that they carry. Some of us are carrying anger that we don't need to carry. Some of us are carrying unforgiveness, bitterness. It's the reality, friends. And you know what? Praise God, my young friend. Praise God. Praise God, my sister. Praise God for that. And I'm telling you something. You know, when you come here, God is going to lift that burden. You're not going to leave the same way. God knows exactly what you are going through. Maybe someone forsake you, betrayed you, and as a result, you don't know how to get over it. But I'm telling you, there's power in beholding Jesus. I can't do nothing for you, but I know a man. Oh, my friends, there's still power in Jesus. Is there one more for Jesus Christ? I don't want to pray without you coming. I know God is appealing to your heart. Maybe you're struggling. My friends, praise God, my dear sister. Praise God. Heaven is well pleased by everyone that is willing to stand for God. Is there one more for Jesus Christ? I want to pray for you. I want you to lift, leave with the lightness. And by the way, let me tell you something. If you are struggling, stop trying to convince yourself of what you need to do. You need to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. You need to give your life to Christ. You need to behold Jesus Christ. Don't say what I'm not going to do the next time. Oh, you know, I'm never going to go to the club. I'm never going to smoke. I'm never going to drink. I'm never going to go with those friends. I'll never go to that lady, that woman that I shouldn't be going to. I'll never do it again. No, 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 no. What you should say, Lord, help me to behold Jesus. And God will change you. He will show you a lens of sin. And he will show you the solution which is in himself. Is there one more for Jesus Christ? As we close, let's go to our knees as we sing into my hearts. Come into my hearts. And if there's still one more, you want to slip out of your seat, come at this time. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart. Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay, to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Let us pray, loving eternal Father. We thank you for your presence that is here. We thank you, Lord, that burdens are still lifted at Calvary. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. And now we can find power to live the transformed life. But our greatest need, if we truly would confess, is that we need to behold Jesus. We need to behold that love, that love that constrained him. Against the odds, he suffered so much, but he still was willing to take abuse, to be mocked while he was the king of glory because of this love. Oh, Father, and as we behold it, may we be changed, Lord, into your likeness. Give us of your spirit, Lord, your Holy Spirit, that we may never be the same. Lift every burden in this place, Lord. Especially those that have come forward, you know the burden that they are carrying. I pray that you may lift it even now, Lord. And that you may help that they may walk in newness of life with a lightness, with a burden-free mind to know that, Lord, you will carry the burden. Because we cannot carry it. We thank you, Lord, for those that have come forward. And I pray you may enter into their varied situation and that you may retrofit a blessing. 
please lord make a way where there seems to be no way remember those that should have come forward but lord you know their circumstance oh father you know our frame attend to them lord and lift their burdens also have mercy upon this congregation and we thank you we praise you we give our hearts to your fresh lord in jesus name amen amen